views expressed on this episode of My Take Radio do not reflect the views, thoughts, or feelings of the My Take Radio staff, My Take Radio advertisers, or My Take Radio content partners. Listener and viewer discretion is advised. This coverage is live and uncensored, so if you have any small children present, you may want to have them leave the room. What's going on, guys? My Take Radio, episode 386, powered by RageWorks, broadcasting live Wednesday, January 11th, 2017. I'm your host, Rich, and our call-in number is 347-324-3541. Again, that call-in number, 347-324-3541. If this is your first time tuning into My Take Radio, My Take Radio is a variety show covering mixed martial arts, professional wrestling, gaming, and entertainment. Wednesday nights, we cover MMA and wrestling with a start time of 11.30 p.m. Eastern, 8.30 p.m. Pacific. Thursdays, we switch gears and jump into gaming, entertainment, and a little tech for good measure. Same start time, 11.30 p.m. Eastern, 8.30 p.m. Pacific on Thursdays. You can watch, listen, and participate in tonight's broadcast or any of our other live broadcasts by heading over to mtrlive.com. You will find a couple of video feeds there, as well as an audio-only feed powered by Mixler, which you can also listen to on your mobile device by downloading the Mixler app, punching in My Take Radio, and you'll be able to listen to the live show from the comfort of your mobile device. You can also use our call-in number 347-324-3541, 347-324-3541, as another way to listen to the show. If you would like to participate, just hit option 1, to enter the caller queue. Aside from that, this live show will be available in podcast format within 24 to 48 hours of airing, and you can find it on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, and, of course, on RageWorks.net. All right, so first and foremost, want to open up and wish all of you a happy new year. Hope you guys had a great holiday season. Uh, You know, obviously, we wrapped up right before Christmas with... um, our live shows for 2016 and we took some time off. Part of it obviously was to recharge, but in addition to that, we also um, took the opportunity to apply our energies to making some improvements on the site. You know, we definitely wanted to do that. That was key. And um, I think that we had a good time with that minus a couple of hiccups, which I'll get into in a moment. But above all, I think, um, you know, we did we did all right. Now, with that said, there are a couple of things I got to bring to everyone's attention. Um, first thing is, obviously, that we will be, uh, you know, winding down the live shows, which I mentioned before, going into uh, 2017. Tonight's show is going to be the final live MMA and wrestling edition of MTR, and tomorrow's show will be the final gaming and entertainment edition of My Take Radio. Uh, We intend on switching back to the podcast-only format uh, going forward starting next week. We will be releasing shows, same schedule, releasing MMA and wrestling on Wednesdays and gaming and entertainment on Thursdays. Same deal, though. Um, Really excited for that, only because, as I said before we wrapped up in 2016, just a, a, a way to just work a little bit more efficiently um, you know, live shows are great. We actually are testing out running into uh, streaming to Facebook Live, which hopefully is working as well um, through a new service. But I think that going back to podcast format is easier. You guys can consume the show 
at your at your leisure. And of course, it just takes away the hurdle of a lot of the stuff that goes into live prep. And um, like I said, we're still going to come back and do live shows on occasion. I think um, we're definitely going to shoot to do episode 400 live. I think that'll be a cool thing to do. And um, really excited for that, doing our 400th episode live. I think that would be a nice way to to do that. And that's probably going to be the course of action going forward. We're going to be doing just live shows either for milestone episodes or for any sort of special occasions or if we have certain guests We'll do something live to involve you guys. But going forward, everything will be released in podcast format and can be found on the RageWorks Network podcast feed, which you can find on iTunes, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio. Now, the other elephant in the room I wanted to address are the problems we have been having with the website. As many of you know, the website has been notoriously finicky. And um, part of that is because during the holiday break, we moved to a new web host Um, our original web host, we kind of outgrew them because we had a lot of images on our site, which of course raised the, the, the amount of space that was, um, allocated for the website with that particular hosting company. And because of that, we had to, uh, take our ball and go home, so to speak. So we went to another hosting company and, um, it has been without a doubt, a complete pain in the ass. Um, part of it just because of the way our site is set up was its own fair share of challenges coupled with the fact that the hosting provider had like a fire inclement weather, just a a bunch of, of things. So it definitely snowballed into me pretty much having to do support tickets from December 2nd through uh, January 11th. So we've been, we've been doing a lot of support tickets for different things, moving to another server on the same hosting company in hopes that that can resolve some of our issues. If not, we will probably be moving once again to a new web host. But for those of you that have been, you know, patient with us, uh, we apologize for that. That's something that I was hoping we would resolve by the time the holiday break was over. And, um, you know, we would get back to business. Unfortunately, you know, challenges present themselves and it is what it is. A couple of things um, before we crack open tonight's MMA and wrestling As I said, uh, podcast episodes will start being available uh, going forward, beginning Wednesdays for MMA and wrestling Thursdays for gaming and entertainment. It will remain the same schedule. Of course, biweekly, you're still going to get the variant issue every Wednesday, and you will get weekly, uh, call me when it's over, the regular season sportscast, and I believe Black is the New Black is going to be doing biweekly. I think they're trying to get on a weekly schedule, but... I will find out that information and, of course, share it with you guys. As always, questions, concerns, uh, feedback, feel free to reach out, rich at rageworks.net or mtrhost at mytakeradio.com, whichever you prefer. All right, so on deck for tonight, I want to talk a little bit about Ronda Rousey's lost, uh, her lost, (laughs) her loss to close out 2016, uh, where she goes from there. I want to talk about Cody Garbrandt and his performance against Dominic Cruz want to break down the week in MMA, a couple of interesting news stories that I want to get into. On the wrestling side, we'll talk Raw, SmackDown, 205 Live, and some of the wrestling news of the week, including uh, potential rumors for the Hall of Fame, WrestleMania heading to New Orleans, and as usual, anything and everything else that comes up. As always, feel free to uh, share your thoughts in the chat room, mtrlive.com, or call in 347 324-3541, 347-324-3541. All right, let's get the ball rolling and jump into some MMA, shall we? All right. Wow. I really have to get new headphones. I think that the cable for this headphone is on its way out. Um, So on the MMA side of things, we got a, yeah, I don't know, Val. That was a, um, (laughs) it definitely did sound a little scratchy. I don't know what the hell is going on. Clearly these are the things I got to deal with on the live, on the live show. So um, apologies. Anyway, as I was saying, the, it, it was, you know, an interesting week in MMA 
And it was also an interesting closeout to 2016. Obviously, the UFC had their last event uh, the last Friday of December. Ronda Rousey, Amanda Nunes was your, your big grab. Of course, it was Ronda's return to the cage. And obviously, Cody Garbrandt looking to upset uh, reigning champion Dominic Cruz. Now, the card itself was pretty solid. A lot of great finishes, a lot of great performances. Um, I want to start off with the Cody Garbrandt, Dominic Cruz fight. That fight for me was probably one of the top fights of 2016. Uh, the, the craziest thing that happened was the fact that these guys, they, the buildup was incredibly intense. Lots going on leading into it, including, uh, you know, just trash talking from Dominic Cruz, a shitload of trash talking from Cody Garbrandt, nearly coming to blows at numerous events. Um, A lot of people were unsure of who had the advantage going into this fight mentally. Was it Dominic Cruz? Was it Cody Garbrandt? A lot of people felt Dominic Cruz had rattled Cody Garbrandt going into this fight and kind of made the, he, you know, made the young upstart. He got in the young upstart's head. Obviously, Cody Garbrandt coming out of Team Alpha Male has a huge and lengthy history with Dominic Cruz, of course, going back to Uriah Faber. Uh, what went on with TJ Dillashaw, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I was pleasantly surprised when that bell rang and we saw a different Cody Garbrandt composed and incredibly brash and cocky, but with some amazing striking that he brought to the table. I was blown away by how he out Dominic Cruz, Dominic Cruz. Like that was, that's the, that's the easiest way to sum it up. I mean, there was a lot of Really, really impressive footwork, a lot of really impressive striking, and the end result, of course, was Dominic Cruz uh, losing the belt to Cody Garbrandt in a very, very hard-fought battle, which to me was amazing. I mean, it was it was insane from from start to finish. I have never seen some shit like that. I mean, oh, wait a minute. I just found out why the audio is so shitty. Let's bring that down a couple of notches. That should help. (laughs) As I was saying, you know, we, we, we saw some really, really, really crazy, crazy footwork. What the fuck is that? Oh, thank you, Jay. Jay uploaded his uh, latest, latest show. As I was saying, you know, the, the fight itself, like I said, definitely fight of the year uh, contender. And it did not disappoint Cody Garbrandt. You know, for all the shit talking he did, you know, giving the belt to to the to the young fan and really just the story that led up to that fight was tremendous. Dominic Cruz was, you know, classy in defeat and, you know, Cody Garbrandt looking towards the next challenger, which probably might be TJ Dillashaw, who had an amazing performance of his own, really, really looking crisp in that fight. And um, to Dillashaw is pretty much. On paper, the guy that is next in line, of course, Cody, Gar- Cody Garbrandt is open to fight whoever. I mean, there was a rumor of, of him trying to angle a fight with Conor McGregor because everyone wants to fight Conor McGregor at this point. I think um, you would not find any fighter, male or female, that does not want to get into the cage with McGregor for the big payday. Uh, th- for me personally, uh, you know, Garbrandt has plenty of challengers. You can run it back with Dominic Cruz. You can do a fight with TJ Dillashaw any way you slice it. There are definitely some compelling fights in that division. Now, moving into the Ronda Rousey, Amanda Nunes fight, Ronda came out. Obviously, there was a media blackout going in. Not too much was said from Rousey's camp. She released a video and, you know, just incredibly cold blooded on the build up to the fight and when the bell rang, it was, it was all Amanda Nunez. I mean, the striking, everything she, she pretty much brought the pain and dispatched Ronda Rousey in highlight real fashion. Now, of course there, there was a lot of, there was a lot of talk after Ronda Rousey lost a lot of feedback, a lot of, a lot of things said on social media, uh, some supportive, but for the most part, very, 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 uh, negative. And, and I mean, this is that we're talking about celebrities, politicians, you name it. Somebody had something to say about Ronda Rousey's performance. Um, it's, you know, this is, this is how I look at it. People are very, very fickle. 
You know, everybody loves you when you're on the top of the mountain and everybody's quick to kick you when you're down. And for me personally, I think that Ronda Rousey did a lot for this sport. Whether you love her or hate her, she did a lot for this for this sport. I mean, she helped this sport mainstream when Gina Carano decided to take her ball and go home. And what people don't understand is that the UFC at the time, and you guys know this better than anyone, if you've listened to previous episodes, you know that Dana White went on record and said, we will never have women fight in the UFC. And Ronda Rousey changed that. When it came to MMA legislation in New York State, who was up there talking to politicians? Ronda Rousey, Chris Weidman. And again, whether you love them or you hate them, you know, their contributions to the sport can't be ignored. And yes, can we say that Ronda's striking was complete dog shit? We all know that it was. Can we blame her coach, Edmund? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, your coach isn't the one that goes in there with you. Period. You know, you have a team, you have a training camp, you have all this shit. But at the end of the day, you go in there. And, you know, Mike Tyson said it best. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And that's exactly what it was. You know, it was... Ronda probably drilled whatever she needed to drill worked on her, you know, on her cat, on her cat hand speed, you know, and I say that just cat jabs, you know, with the, with the bent wrist and that was it. And pretty much the outcome that happened was an outcome that really did not shock me. And I only say this because would I have liked Ronda to win and return back to prominence? Sure. But at the end of the day, you know, technique and hard work, and just a desire to be the best are going to win out. Obviously, that and and having a fucking cast iron chin and dynamite fists also helps. But for me, yes, was I disheartened to see Ronda lose? Absolutely. But I was more disheartened to see so many fans essentially kick her when she was down. And these are the same fans that were extolling the virtues of how great Ronda Rousey was and she'll never be beaten and she'll kill cyborg, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm not talking about the fans that have been watching the sport for a long time and can discuss it intelligently. I'm talking about the people that if you go back on their Twitter timeline a year ago or, you know, prior to Ronda losing to Holly and all you would see was just, yo, Ronda's a beast, blah, blah, blah. They would share pictures, et cetera, et cetera. And, and some of these people I know, and it's just amazing how, how quickly people forget what she brought to the table. And, and here's another thing, and I've talked about this with Jimbo Slice and with other people. And, you know, he, you know, Jimbo Slice made a, a very, a very, um, very, very uh, valid point to me not that long ago. And he said, you know, the, when, when you're at the top, yes, you're at the top, but if you're not fighting the caliber of opponents that you should be fighting, people are always going to look at you differently. And it's true. It's like, look at Chris Weidman. And we've talked about this. Chris Weidman, and I've said it before, must lie awake at night knowing that, yes, he beat Anderson Silva, but he didn't beat the Anderson Silva. He didn't beat Anderson Silva that was at the top of his game. He beat the cocky Anderson Silva the first time, and the second time he beat a guy whose leg fucking broke. Simple as that. And for me, I think that the worst part is, like I said, you know, when it came to Ronda Rousey, Ronda Rousey's skill level at the time was leaps and bounds ahead of pretty much every one of her opponents because every one of her opponents were either, you know, they had decent striking or decent wrestling, but they were, for all intents and purposes, just decent fighters. Again, I'm not saying that they're that they were terrible because they weren't. Each one of those fighters had their own their own merits, but they were decent in their own way, and they fell victim to the Ronda Rousey armbar trap, and that was it. But as soon as you ran into fighters that were more complete, had a more complete skill set, or just had a more dominant primary fighting style, then that's when Ronda Rousey got destroyed. I mean, look at Holly Holm. Holly Holm stand up, you know. It, yes, some people will will debate that her stand up wasn't as good as everybody thought, but even still, her main discipline coming into that was boxing, which not only added to the power that she brought to the table, but also gave her a better type of footwork going into that fight. When you look at Amanda Nunes, 
Same thing. Amanda Nunes was a more complete fighter. And because of that, you know that Amanda Nunes trains, you know, in Brazil, has a great BJJ background, has amazing stand up. And these are all factors that have to be considered going in. Now, when you look at Ronda, the people that Ronda defeated, you and, and you know, again, not taking anything away from them, but Misha Tate, Misha Tate beat Holly Holm because Holly Holm did not know how to defend from, you know, wrestling, good wrestling, which Misha Tate had, thus giving Misha Tate the victory. But at the end of the day, Misha Tate had her will broken. That's why Misha Tate lost. Going back to Rousey's other opponents, same thing. They came in, they wanted to go and make a statement, and, you know, they got dispatched in, in quick fashion. I mean, Kat Zingano, you know, she ran out there trying to do some crazy shit. As soon as Ronda Rousey grabbed the limb, that was it. And that was another thing, too. Amanda Nunes is a stronger fighter. Yeah, you could grab a limb and try and work, work around it, but first of all, you have to get in close enough to grab that limb and secondly, you got to get in there and grab that limb without getting your fucking face beat in. And for me, you know, it's, it's one of those things where Ronda Rousey still has something to bring to the table. And I'm going to do, I'm going to do armchair MMA analysis for once. And, um, I think Ronda Rousey still has lots to offer the UFC. I really do. Whether it's as an ambassador for the sport or as a competitor, but I will say that if you want to get the best out of Ronda Rousey, you will need to have her go to a new training camp, period. Edmund Tarvedian is, you know, he served his purpose. But at the end of the day, a change of scenery for certain fighters does not hurt. On the contrary, there are instances where that change of scenery just, just makes a fighter completely evolve. I mean, TJ Dillashaw was good in Team Alpha Male, then he went... And he started training elsewhere, and you know he just became a completely different fighter. That's that's just how it is. And I think that there's there's plenty of potential there for Ronda to you know whether it's going to Jackson's, whether it's going to AKA wherever. I think that another training camp can really help round out Ronda Rousey in terms of her striking. Yes, there's there's plenty of people that have stepped up and want to help her improve her striking, but at the end of the day, it's a decision she is going to have to make on her own. And right now, in all honesty, her future is incredibly cloudy. But many people feel that she'll be back. But I also feel that psychologically, the previous loss and this one have definitely taken their toll. And if we were to see Ronda Rousey back, and I'm going to be honest... I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect it for at least six to eight months. I know that she was medically suspended uh, due to her loss. Um, I believe she suffered some, some trauma that I believe gave her a six month suspension. So we may, you know, we, if we do see her, we probably see her uh, towards the tail end of 2017. If not, she may, she may retire. Now it's easy to say, oh, you know, Ronda can go to WWE, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, and I agree. A lot of people feel that, Ronda Rousey's a quote-unquote broken toy, and her going to WWE is not going to be as lucrative because she is not at the top of her food chain. And I, I disagree, and I'll tell you why. Yes, in the real world, Ronda Rousey lost two fights against two high-caliber opponents, but she could probably beat up most people still. And I'm not saying this, you know, to, to devalue anyone, but at most women on the street would get their ass kicked, period. Like, that's just the name of the game. Most of those divas on the WWE roster would probably get their ass whooped. And, and I'm talking just real world fighting with, with Ronda Rousey. So I believe that having her in the sport, she's, a, you know, having her in professional wrestling, she's a fan of the sport. She is... She understands the process. She knows what has to go into it. And best of all, it's making money without having to go through the rigors of training camps and all this bullshit. You just got to take bumps, know how to put together good matches, tell good stories. Well, you know, knowing how to wrestle is, is, is also subjective, but I'll get into that later on. But there's, there's definitely an opportunity for Ronda Rousey, and WWE knows this. Uh, she has name recognition. She has mainstreamed. 
and it's just another another way to get to get press. Simple as that. Now I want to, you know, I want to go to the chat real quick. Um, Val says, "Yeah, I think the common theme is fuck Edmund." And then Val adds, "Yeah, we all knew that if she didn't go for the clutch, she was going to lose." To which Val also adds, "That's why Weidman was going after the who's who of his division." Um. Val also adds, as an MMA fan, I think her retiring after this loss would deprive the sport of good fights and honestly would diminish her legacy. So with that said, and I want, I want to acknowledge what Val said, I, like, that's exactly it. Going out on a loss for someone of that caliber, I, I mean, obviously you could go back in there and lose again and retire, and it may just be that the sport has passed you by. It can happen. Or you're just making a comment... Uh, you know, uh, a common uh, a common sense decision to protect yourself in the long run. I mean, Uriah Faber, di- you know, he dictated when it was his time to retire, and he did, and and he went out strong. He went out with a victory. Uh, Misha Tate, she retired, but Misha Tate got broken in her fight. Also, she was mentally broken, and if you've seen the video of her on the stool, you know that she was already done mentally. That was it, and I think. Excuse me. I think Ronda Rousey still, like I said, she has something to add to the sport of mixed martial arts, and there's there's still an opportunity for her. Now, of course, the big question is, does Ronda come back and immediately challenge for the title? No. And that, my friends, is is exactly the problem. Ronda Rousey lost to Holly Holm, who in turn lost to Misha Tate. Misha Tate, in turn, lost to Amanda Nunes. What you should have done is Ronda should have came back, run it back with Holly Holm. The winner should have fought Amanda Nunes, period. And I understand in terms of MMA math and money and and trying to get paid that that was the right thing to do, but it, it wasn't. It really, really, really wasn't. I'm being honest. At the end of the day, I think that what fucked them up was the fact that they they got they got greedy. Oh, we're gonna have Rhonda come out. She's gonna dispatch this chick, and that's gonna be it. Daddy Dana thought that he had it all figured out, and Amanda Nunes played the role of spoiler. Simple as that. Anyway, let's get into some of the other MMA news and move things along. So, a lot of people reached out to me after Meryl Streep's comments about MMA. During the Golden Globes. And I, I understood what, what she was trying to do. And a lot of people, you know, they, they, a, lot of, a lot of people were upset. Obviously, the, the, the MMA community was upset. Dana White was upset. And um, it's, it's interesting because, at, you know, the bigger picture, obviously, was the, the anti-Trump message, which... This isn't a political show. I'm not going to get into politics, but that was the bigger, the bigger elephant in the room. You know, her statement, so Hollywood is crawling with outsiders and foreigners, so if we kick them all out, you'll have nothing to watch but football and mixed, mar- and mixed martial arts, which are not the arts. And obviously, you know, NFL players took offense, mixed martial artists took offense, and people... You know, I had this discussion with my manager. We were talking about it, and he was like, well, you know, martial arts. And I, and I said, I'm like, martial arts has an artistic value. The sport of mixed martial arts is the exhibition in a full contact environment of that art form. And I'll explain. If you've ever gone to a park and seen, a, seen a, a, an older Asian man practice Tai Chi, and I mean really practice it. It is a beautiful thing to watch. If you watch a wushu martial arts demonstration of wushu kung fu, you will see artistry at work. Period. If you watch any sort of kata and forms that are done for various disciplines, they are things of beauty. Mixed martial arts, uh, point fighting, boxing, etc. They are all displays of an art form and it is the art of combat period. And yes, is, is there, is there 
an an, an air of, of barbaric nature in watching football, in watching MMA, in watching boxing, in watching watching pro wrestling. Sure. But we've been watching motherfuckers kill each other for our enjoyment since the beginning of time. Whether it was the gladiators in the Coliseums, uh, you know, the fighting pits, we have been watching this forever. And it's not just humans fighting. We watch animals fight too, whether it's dog fighting, fucking cockfighting, um, praying mantises fighting, mantises I don't even think is a word, uh, Japanese fighting fish fighting. We, we watch people and animals kill each other for our amusement. We fucking do. Period. And yes, were, was the MMA community entitled to be upset about it? Sure. But at the end of the day, it is the opinion of one person. And if you're going to let the opinion of one person completely ruin some of the better things that the sport has done, then you're playing right into the game. That's it. As a fan of the sport, I, I, I get it. I get that it's easy to look at it as a barbaric sport. But there's a lot of discipline, camaraderie, and, and, just, and just good sportsmanship more times than I care to admit. Simple. There, there, there's been plenty of times. There's been plenty of times where you've seen, you know, when the UFC does the fighting for the troops or when things are done for charity or when things are done for the community. And I'm not just talking about the organizations. I am also talking about the fighters. I am also talking about the training camps that go and do things in the community and are active in the community. I mean, one of the things that Conor McGregor said when he was building up for his fight for Nate Diaz was clowning Nate Diaz about being a badass, but yet going and speaking at a school. And it was funny at the time, but think about it. Nobody talks about that. Uriah Faber shared a picture of him and Nick Diaz, and he was like, hey, you know, I remember when Nick came in and, you know, we worked with some kids and blah, 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 and it was such an awesome day. And that's the kind of stuff that no one talks about. It's easy to talk about the big things, you know, the Ronda Rousey 48-second loss, the women fighting, the barbarism, the violence, uh, you know, all the negative things like War Machine and, and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there, there are a lot of good things as well. There are. And same thing with boxing. For every, for every barbaric thing that you have to say about boxing, there are dozens of things that can be said about what, what you know, various boxers have done for the community. Um, you know, some of the things that they've done, some of the guys that have really made a big impact, whether you're talking about, you know, legends like Joe Lewis or Muhammad Ali, even Mike Tyson, who's been doing a lot of things and, and you know, you know, charity work and talking about, uh, you know, mental health issues and even sharing his struggles so that other athletes don't have to endure the things that he did. It, again, there's there's art in everything. Sometimes you gotta you gotta dig through the bullshit and find the art form. But martial arts as a whole, not even the uh, uh, you know of the mixed martial arts variety, but martial arts as a whole has artistic value. And yes, everybody reached out and they're like, man, you know, you're into movies, blah blah blah. What do you think about this? And I was like, listen, everyone's entitled to their opinion. Not everybody's supposed to like the shit that everybody else does. It's that simple. Just don't. You know, I like MMA. I don't follow boxing as much, even though it's a combat sport. I should, but I don't. I watch pro wrestling. I watch kickboxing. I watch MMA. Should I be watching boxing? Of course. But it's just not for me, for whatever reason. Am I aware of it? Do I understand it? Sure. But it's just not something I do. And like I said, everybody got all up in arms about it. And it's fine. You're entitled to it. But what does it matter? It, it, like I said, it's the opinion uh, of a lady who is successful, has made a shit ton of money, and used the Golden Globes as a platform to share her message. And you, as an American, are entitled to agree with it, disagree with it, and, you know, that's it. Simple as that. Val says, violence is a part of nature. There's no denying it, There's no denying it and people need to accept it. Valid point. He said, uh, isn't Cody Garbrandt a big brother to that kid that comes out with him to the fights? There's, there, there's, a, there's a huge story about the Cody Garbrandt situation. Um, Slick, if you can, 
you can probably pull up that story and share that share it in there if people want to get the full scoop. Uh, you could probably punch in Cody Garbrandt and um, I, I believe it's Cody Garbrandt and uh, young man with cancer or something like that. Like I forgot what the main think piece was, but I'm sure you could find it. In any case, those are those are my thoughts on Meryl Streep's commentary. All right, so a couple of fight cards have been finalized across the board. UFC 208, of course, February 11th at the Barclays in Brooklyn. Um, Holly Holm, Jermaine Durandamy will be facing off for the featherweight title. Um, obviously, this is the beginning of the women's featherweight division, which everybody was expecting Cyborg to be a part of. But given Cyborg having some out of competition drug testing issues, that is the end of that. In any case, Holly Holm, Jermaine Durandamy is your main event. Travis Brown, Derek Lewis on that card. Jim Miller, Dustin Poirier. Ian McCall's also on that card. Rowan Carnero's also on that card. Um, very solid. Again, if you're in New York City, it's at the Barclays, February 11th. Also, another card that was finalized, even though a couple of things fell apart going into the card, was UFC 103, which takes place this Sunday. Um, there were a couple of movements that had to be done, including the Sergio Pettis John Moraga fight being moved to the main card as Jimmy Rivera had to be pulled from his planned fight with Marlon Rivera, which of course necessitated the change. Now the prelims are on UFC fight pass starting at six o'clock. The pre the main prelims will be on Fox sports. One Tony Martin, Alex white are on that fight. Alexi Olenek is taking on Victor Pesta and Augusto Mendez is taking on Frankie signs again, Fox sports one, 8 PM. And then at 10 o'clock, John Moraga, Sergio Pettis will kick us off. Then court McGee, Ben Saunders, Marcin Held and Joe Lazan, which is going to be amazing. And the main event, Yara Rodriguez taking on the returning prodigy, BJ Penn. Again, Fox Sports 1, 10 p.m. this Sunday, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Again, the prelims also on Fox Sports 1 and UFC Fight Pass. Now, of course, you know, the last UFC show for 2016 saw obviously Ronda Rousey's loss, Cody Garbrandt's ascension, but it was also the final UFC event for Mike Goldberg. As many of you know, Mike Goldberg has been a staple on UFC broadcasts alongside Joe Rogan, uh, playing, you know, color commentary and play by play duties. Uh, Those guys had amazing chemistry and don't get me wrong. um, Mike Goldberg had plenty of fucking verbal flubs on on an infinite number of broad on on a infinite is a is a is a terrible number to use on on a, on a spectacularly large number of broadcasts but it was always good to see Mike Goldberg and Joe Rogan mixing it up they had a great dynamic they had like i said amazing chemistry and it was fun man you know Goldberg would you know do the the play by play Rogan would share a lot of the the deeper insights into the sport and they were a tremendous duo. I was really dumbfounded and shocked that the UFC didn't even want to give him a proper send-off. It, it truly was unfortunate because, like I said, Mike Goldberg has been in the sport for a long time. He brought a lot to the table. And you knew when, when him and, and, and Rogan were doing color commentary, it was always going to be a fun ride. Now, many have wondered who was going to replace him, and there's been a who's who of people They've talked about, you know, former fighters, various uh, personalities in the sports industry, but it looks like it is going to be, and this is pretty fucking crazy, Todd Grisham. Um, According to Pro Wrestling Sheet and a couple of other outlets, uh, Grisham, who worked with WWE from 2004 to 2011 before heading to ESPN, will be working the UFC 103 event this Sunday. Um, as of right now, it looks like he will be Goldberg's replacement. We don't know if it's going to be permanent, but for the most part, it looks like he will be the voice for the foreseeable future. We'll see how he, how he, you know, how he fares this Sunday. Uh, you know, I like Todd Grisham. I thought that, you know, he, he definitely is, is, you know, I have no problem with him being, um, Mike Goldberg's replacement, but there were other guys that I thought definitely had the tools. Uh, Frank Mir definitely, uh, Dan Hardy would have been great. There were there were definitely some guys that I would have liked to have seen in there, especially 
guys that have been part of the sport because they bring something unique to the table. I, I definitely feel that uh, somebody with a, with a deep understanding of MMA would have been good alongside Joe Rogan, maybe even somebody that could just, you know, add to some of the technical stuff that Joe Rogan breaks down. It, it would have been fun. Uh, David in the chat room says, give the job to CM Punk. You, you, you know what's funny? I said that. And the only, I said that to myself, and the only reason I said it was because I remembered when CM Punk would do color commentary in WWE, and it was fucking hilarious. It was hilarious. And like I said, when it comes down to the technical aspects, Joe Rogan had that covered for the most part. If anything, I, I wouldn't even, <clears throat> excuse me, I would not even be, you know, bent out of shape if CM Punk got the job. I'm being honest. I think, I think it would be pretty fucking cool to see that just out of curiosity, just to see it pan out. But if I had to choose, I would probably have liked to have seen boss Rutan and Joe Rogan. I think boss Rutan and Joe Rogan would have been amazing uh, doing color commentary. And if not, and if not Joe Rogan and, and boss, I probably would have gone with Mauro Ronaldo and Joe Rogan. If WWE wouldn't have picked up Mauro, I think that Mauro probably would have got the job immediately more Ronaldo and Joe Rogan would have been fucking stellar and boss Rutan and Joe Rogan would have been equally, equally awesome. Mirko Krokop is in the news this week as he had won the Ryzen open weight tournament, dispatching King Mo Lawal. And um, the funny thing is that he wins the tournament and he had come out of retirement to do the tournament. And now he is going back into retirement once again, uh, he announced it on Nova TV saying that he is retiring after, you know, winning the Ryzen Grand Prix. This is the second time he's retired. He previously retired in 2015. He said, and I quote, that was definitely my last tournament. I have health problems and, th and this is definitely the end of my career. I know I have announced my retirement before, but this is definitely it. Of course, he will remain active in MMA and he'll probably be doing a lot of the international events either as an ambassador or perhaps more than that, but I believe, you know, Mirko Krokop looked really good in, in, in the Ryzen, in the Ryzen event. Um, him and King Mo's fight was interesting to watch. I was, I was a little bit disheartened to see King Mo lose. I like him. I think he's again, one of those colorful characters in the sport of mixed martial arts that you can really, really enjoy. And, but again, losing to, to one of the legends in the sport is, is not, is not that bad. You know I mean? Yes, losing sucks, but losing to a guy like fucking Mirko Krokop, there's, there's worse guys you could lose to. That's all I'm saying. Speaking of legends, on the Bellator side of things, Bellator 172 goes down February 18th. And of course, you're probably asking yourself, why should I give a fuck about Bellator 172? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, mostly because the main event will see the return of Fedor as he takes on Matt Mitrio. Now, a lot of people are probably expecting Fedor to mop the floor with Matt Mitrione, but Matt Mitrione has heavy hands and has played the role of spoiler before. So with that said, all eyes are on The Last Emperor on February 18th, as he makes his return to the cage. Now, here's the thing. I'm a big Fedor fan. I love Fedor. Fedor is awesome. And whether win, loser, win or lose, the guy has been just a force in MMA. And of course, you know, we, we've said this before. He's fought a couple of fucking guys that you're probably like, that guy has no business being in the cage. But he also fought some of the legends in the sport in their fucking prime. Period. I, I, I mean, you're talking about a guy who ate a suplex from Kevin Randleman and survived to win that fight. And, and you know, if you look up that video and of, of Randleman and Fedor and you see that suplex, you will automatically assume that Randleman had it in the fucking bag and he did not. That, you know, and it's not even a dig at Kevin Randleman, you know, um, but it's just the fact that Fedor is just that type of a dude. So it's going to be interesting to see this fight in Bellator a lot of people have asked, will we see Fedor in the UFC? You know, there's, there's a lot of ego at play. Obviously, Dana White, Fedor's management, there's a lot of ego in the equation. 
And while the UFC's new owners are definitely into making a shitload of money and making the 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 organization profitable, I can see them trying to put something together to get Fedor in there before Fedor uh, hangs it up. Now, the problem is, do you bring Fedor in and put him in against a guy who, you know, definitely can can dispatch him? Or do you respect the guy's legacy and give him a guy who is competitive, but the fight can go either way? Uh, in all honesty, if I saw Fedor uh, come to the UFC, I'd like to see him fight at 205 and not to, and not the heavyweight division. I feel that he is a small heavyweight, and the heavyweight division has a lot of fucking dangerous guys. But on the same token, there's a lot of great matchups at heavyweight that many of us would tune in to see. I mean, Fedor and Cain Velasquez alone, or Fedor and Overeem, are worth are worth checking out. But if Fedor cut some weight, went down to 205, I'd like to see a Fedor and Anthony Johnson, or a Fedor and Daniel Cormier, or, you know, Fedor and John Jones. I mean, I got to be honest, John Jones shouldn't be let near a title a title opportunity anytime soon. So if you said Fedor is cutting down to 205 and he's going to fight John Jones, everyone would tune into that fight, period. I would then lock John Jones up in a rubber room and make sure he doesn't get out to go to any parties or get any coke. He's only allowed to come out to train, like on some legit house arrest to not fuck it up. I'm being honest. I'd, lo- I, I'd love to see Fedor cut to 205 and fight John Jones. I think that would be a a fight that could go either way. And for John Jones, it would be an opportunity to fight the man, you know, like that's, that, that would be pretty cool, but we'll see what happens. Like I said, Fedor, Matt Mitrione, Bellator 172, February 18th. Now, if you follow us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash official rage works, you know that I shared the UFC uh, announcement that Tyron Woodley and Steven Wonderboy Thompson will be squaring off once again at UFC 209 on March 4th. Also on that card, originally we were going, to, we were expected to see Mark Hunt take on Alistair Overeem, and I don't think that is going to happen. And you're probably saying, okay, why did Overeem get popped for steroids? And the answer is no. What ended up happening was Mark Hunt has filed a civil suit against the UFC, Brock Lesnar, and Dana White. As many of you know, Brock Lesnar, of course, was found to have violated uh, the UFC's, um, per, you know, banned substances uh, ruling, uh, his ban- the banned substance rules, and he was suspended by the Athletic Commission for a year, fined, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, as many of you know, he went in there and he, you know, did what he usually does, and he beat Mark Hunt, uh, Mark Hunt was obviously upset when he found out that Brock Lesnar was uh, on a band on a band performance enhancer because again this isn't the first time this has happened. This also happened when Mark Hunt fought Bigfoot Silva, and I understand the guy's fucking tired. He goes out there, he trains his ass off, and yes, could Mark Hunt be on something? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, Mark Hunt just looks like a guy that just will pound you into fucking mush. And um, the fact is, I I understand where he's coming from, but I also, and it's funny because there was an article last week that said that he would sue any opponent that was found to have had, uh, you know, that was found to have violated the, the, the banned substance rules that are in place. He said he would sue them personally. And it was, it was interesting to say the least. Um, But to see now that he has filed a suit against the UFC, Brock Lesnar, and Dana White, and he claims racketeering, conspiracy, and fraud in relation to Lesnar's win, which was later overturned at UFC 200. ESPN reported that Hunt filed the suit in U.S. District Court seeking compensatory and punitive damages, along with a demand for the defendants to disgorge their ill-gotten profits. The suit claims that the UFC and its agents have affirmatively circumvented and obstructed fair competition for their own benefit, including being complicit in doping proliferation under the guise of advancing the best anti-doping program in all of professional sports. It claims that the UFC did so via methods, including but not limited to various and rampant purported use exemptions, drug testing exemptions, and by failure to enforce its own policies. 
Hunt argues that UFC officials were either knowledgeable or willfully indifferent to Lesnar's use of banned substances, pointing to his exemption from the requirement that fighters participate in the USADA's testing pool for four months before fighting. Mark Hunt told ESPN, I want the UFC to understand it's not okay to keep doing what they're doing. They're allowing guys to do this. They had a chance to take all the money from this guy because he's a cheater, and they didn't. What message is that sending to the boys and girls who want to be a fighter someday? The message is you just have to cheat like this, and it's okay. In society, if you commit a crime, you pay. Why is it different in MMA? It's hurt the business, so it's even worse. They need to be held accountable. If you guys remember, Brock Lesnar was given an exemption to the USADA testing pool due to the rule that claims that UFC can do so under exceptional circumstances or where the strict where the strict application of that rule would be manifestly unfair to an athlete. And that, my friends, is the smoking gun right there. <clears throat> and I'll explain. Brock Lesnar wanted to fight on the UFC 200 card. Whether he told the UFC six months prior, three months prior, whatever the case may be, Brock Lesnar at the time was an active UFC fighter and as such should have been held to the standard and the strict and the strict testing guidelines that the UFC had in place by allowing him to utilize an exception. You created an opportunity for doping to occur. And that is where Mark hunt genuinely has a right to be pissed off because if everybody else has to be randomly drug tested and be part of the testing pool for four to six months and Brock Lesnar decides on, you know, a month ago he wants to fight, then the UFC should have said, A, listen, we can't let you fight on this card. You got to be in the testing pool for four months. And if everything come back, comes back clear, we'll let you fight on a UFC card four months from now. Obviously, that wasn't the case. Dana White knew that UFC 200 on paper was a complete dog and pony show. So he knew he had to try and make it a, you know, a card that was worth watching and in doing so he not only hurt the reputation of the sport but he also you know antagonized a guy who is not to be taken lightly mark hunt is tired of the bullshit he really is i mean when the fight happened with antonio bigfoot silva that is a fight that legitimately can take years off your fucking career if you guys watch the fight between him and antonio bigfoot silva you'll you wouldn't even know what to do when that fight was over, because those guys legitimately knocked years off their lives in that fight. And to find out that the guy that you were fighting was cheating and, you know, could have given you long-term damage of, 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 you know, various, various types of long-term damage from that fight is, is insane. And I do understand where Mark Hunt is coming from, but I also have to say that you're going to f- to bat against an organization that has deep fucking pockets. And what's going to end up happening, and I hate to say it, is they'll probably let Mark Hunt get out of his contract, they'll pay him a fuckload of money, and send him on his way to not even have to deal with it. Because, again, it is even though a lot of outlets aren't talking about it, it is a very, very big story. And it is a story that does have weight behind it. To add to to the statement, Mark Hunt claims that the exception allowed him to fight an opponent with an unfair advantage and that he suffered severe physical injury as well as economic and non-economic damages, including without limit damage to his reputation, title contention, and future earning capacity. Hunt also claims that the UFC's behavior at UFC 200 is representative of and consistent with a pattern of conduct by defendants who wrongfully jeopardize fighter health and safety for profit in violation of state and federal law and the UFC's own policies. The UFC's pattern of conduct includes, but is not limited to, granting doping exemptions and drug testing exemptions to known doping competitors and causing those drug-enhanced fighters to compete with clean fighters. So, Again, this is this is a story that we're going to definitely be watching very closely. And while, you know, we won't be doing live broadcasts, you, you know, we're definitely going to keep a dialogue, whether it's on our Rageworks group on Facebook 
or via the comment section on the site. But the fact is, I, I, I really understand the frustration that Mark Hunt has. I really do, because I think that you go into this fight expecting to fight a guy who's quote unquote on the same level as you. And we all know that Brock Lesnar got the green blood in him. Like, let's not fucking kid ourselves. And it, it, when we, when I, when he walked out for the, for the face to face and, and the weigh-ins, I'm like Brock Lesnar's juice to the fucking gills. And there's another problem. Brock Lesnar being found guilty by the Nevada state athletic commission and suspended for doping Even though the WWE hasn't had Brock on TV, it makes you wonder, hey, the WWE has a a doping policy of its own. Even if Brock Lesnar is a quote-unquote part-time superstar, he should be held liable in some capacity. And that's that's a very gray area, and a lot of of people have been uh, very vocal about it. I, you know, I look at it from both perspectives. WWE should have definitely done something because they're like, look, we got to set an example because, you know, we've we've popped guys for less and you can't just come in here fucking being juiced to the gills after fighting in the UFC and not not think that people are going to have something to say, you know, and, and it's true. Like Val just said, WWE do, don't test Brock. And it's true. He he doesn't because he is he is um, exempt because of the exemption that part time superstars are not subject to the WWE testing protocol again. A, a, a nice, a nice loophole, but still considering that he was found guilty by a governing uh, sports body for being, you know, testing positive WWE should have definitely, even if it was bullshit, even if they would have find him on, you know, and, and just made it public that they find him for testing positive for something. And you know why I want to say this? Because when Billy Gunn was found to have been juicing for a powerlifting competition, Billy Gunn was not an active competitor at the time and WWE released him from his contract. And yes, Billy Gunn and Brock Lesnar in terms of financial value are fucking lemon, you know, apples and oranges. But at the end of the day, if you got rid of Billy Gunn for the same reason, then Brock Lesnar should have been held accountable in some capacity, even if to just quiet any critics. That's all I'm saying. Simple as that. Anyway, Two last bits of MMA news to wrap things up. Uh, Bellator MMA's president, Scott Coker, did an interview with Newsweek recently, and he actually said that he is interested in CM Punk being part of Bellator in the future. He said if he was free from any contractual obligations and he wanted to fight, we would definitely love to have a conversation with him. I believe he's still under contract with the UFC. So there you have it. Uh, Looks like Bellator may be a potential place for CM Punk to hang his hat if the UFC decides to not go forward with the Punk experiment. And the last one, a bit of news that should probably be, uh, you know, a big, big uh, victory for guys like the Diaz brothers. TMZ is reporting that the Nevada State Athletic Commission is considering removing marijuana from their prohibited substances list which of course affects any athletes who compete there. This comes after the state of Nevada legalized marijuana. There will be a meeting to discuss it this week, and it's looking very, very likely that it will be removed. If this happens, it will take roughly three months to go into effect, which means, of course, Nick Diaz and Nate Diaz are free to smoke as much weed as they want before they fight in the state of Nevada. If you guys remember... Nick Diaz was given a five-year ban for testing positive for marijuana. And of course, the controversy from that decision led to the suspension being reduced to 18 months. So there you have it, guys. It looks like marijuana may be coming off the prohibited substances list. And I'm sure that in Stockton, California, somebody lit a fucking doobie in celebration. All right. That is going to wrap up the MMA for this episode. Let us switch gears and jump into some pro wrestling. WWE Raw was um, interesting this week. 
And it's funny because we were having a conversation in my office last week about how SmackDown has become a better show to watch than Monday Night Raw. And there's, there's, different, there's different reasons for it. I mean, Raw this week was all right. It had a couple of good matches. Um, overall, you know, Undertaker showing up, as soon as they're like, oh, the Undertaker showing up on Raw, I said, he's entering the Rumble. I knew it, and that's what it was. As for Shawn Michaels, I said to myself, I don't think he's entering the Royal Rumble, but stranger things have happened. So Shawn Michaels showed up to promote, uh, you know, a family-friendly film that he is going to be in. And um, The Undertaker showed up, essentially preventing Mick Foley from getting fired to uh, announce that he is entering the Royal Rumble, which, um, listen, The Undertaker entering the Royal Rumble raises a ton of questions. I mean, there's going to be ample markout moments. Lesnar and The Undertaker facing off one time, definitely going to get crowd, the crowd pumped. Le- you know, The Undertaker and Goldberg in there. Uh, Goldberg and Braun Strowman. Strowman and the undertaker. There's, there's so many, there's going to be so many cool moments like that. Again, these aren't things that I want to see on my fucking TV, but they're cool to see just like, Oh shit. That's, that's pretty badass. But, um, you know, raw raw was okay. Uh, we had some good cruiserweight matches. I really liked the Jack Gallagher and drew Gulak match. Uh, I like what they're doing with Neville. I, I felt that, you know, net since turning him heel, uh, Neville's got a, he's become a breath of fresh air in a cruiserweight division that, the only established heels are Aria Davari and, um, you know, the Brian Kendrick. Uh, it's nice to see, nice to see him in there, uh, looking more and more like Thor and Oakenshield every week. I laugh when he comes out as the uh, saying, you know, he's the king of the cruiserweights. I'm like, he is essentially uh, Wade Barrett is essentially Neville if Neville got a Super Mario mushroom. <laughs> so uh, give him the crown. Fuck it, let him come out with a little crown. And do his uh, do, do what he's got to do. I mean, you know, it's 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 not bad. Uh, you know, I'm tired of the whole Enzo and Kaz feud with um, Lana and Rusev, and now Jinder Mahal, who is clearly doing a very good cycle of roids. Because Jinder Mahal has never been that ripped and never been that jacked. So um, he's he's definitely he's definitely on some shit. Let's not let's not kid ourselves, but. That 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 entire angle and feud is definitely running its course. On top of the fact that yes, we know that Kaz is is nursing a knee injury, but it, the the shtick is the shtick is is definitely not the move. It's getting really fucking old. Um, Sheamus and Luke Gallows was probably one of the worst matches I saw on Monday. I understand that you're trying to do something with the club and make them make them viable, but you guys. You know, you guys turned them into the testicle inspectors for like for like a month and a half when they were feuding with the New Day. And all of a sudden now we're supposed to view them as a credible threat. You guys got a lot of fucking work to do. Uh, Charlotte and Nia Jax taking on Bailey and Sasha Banks. We know where it's going. Obviously, uh, Sasha will eventually turn on Bailey. Then we'll get a nice Bailey and Sasha program to give us some of the great matches that we saw in NXT. None of this is a shock. Um, as for Nia Jax, we know that Nia Jax is being groomed for a title run. I, I doubt she's, you know, it's going to be, uh, she's going to win the belt, you know, with Charlotte, but she may probably take the title off of Bailey in the future. And I actually think that Nia Jax and Bailey have some good matches. Uh, Bailey definitely knows how to carry Nia to a good match, and Nia Jax has improved quite a bit since coming up. Not a fan of the whole Titus O'Neil. Uh, new day thing. I mean, don't get me wrong. I used to say that Titus would have been good for the new day, but to do it, you know, to turn that into some really half-assed angle has, you know, hasn't really done anybody any favors. And on the contrary, it shows that the new day they're bored and they got nothing to do. Um, I honestly wouldn't, I wouldn't be against Titus O'Neil joining the faction. Like I said, uh, I feel that like, you know, a four man stable gives opportunity to each of those members to capture titles um, Xavier Woods, I don't know if he's, un- I think Kofi Kingston might be close to the 205 weight limit, or I think Xavier Woods might be a little closer. I wouldn't mind seeing Xavier Woods compete at cruiserweight. Um, Kofi make a run at the, you know, at, at you know, at the, um, icy title. I mean the U S title, I should say. And, um, 
Big E and Titus O'Neil maybe make a run at the tag team titles or maybe even start grooming Big E for the main event. I don't think uh, Titus O'Neil being part of a faction of the New Day would be bad. I think that the way that they're, you know, that they're utilizing the New Day now is just fucking boring. It really is. I'm like, oh, we're, we're doing this now? Okay, whatever. As for the U.S. title handicap match, you know, Chris Jericho won. He is now your United States champion. Kevin Owens, of course, is your universal champion. It was a, it was a decent match. We knew, uh, you know, looking at the, at the way that that match was laid out, I'm like, uh, Owens is going to help Jericho. Jericho is going to win. And this pretty much sets up Roman Reigns defeating Kevin Owens at the Rumble. Now, I'm interested to see if Kevin Owens loses the belt to Roman Reigns and goes in the Rumble. I, I would think that that would be a smart play for KO if he did that. Um, I, I would, <laughs> that would be fucking amazing if he just went in and got to like the final four or some shit. It would, be, it would be cool to do, but of course that would require creativity and ingenuity on the writers, on, the, on, the, on behalf of the writers, so I don't see that happening. But, you know, everybody's like, oh, you know, it's cool. Chris Jericho won the U.S. title, and then I said... You, you guys do know that Roman is probably going to win, right? <laughs> He's probably winning. Um, Val says Balor's going to win the Rumble or Bray Wyatt. Um, Finn Balor has been kind of touch and go with regards to being in the Royal Rumble. You never know. He may come in, not do too much, and be eliminated, but you never know. He, can, he may come in and shock everyone. But I got to be honest. I wouldn't be shocked if The Undertaker won the Royal Rumble. Wouldn't be shocked. I wouldn't be shocked if Goldberg won the Royal Rumble. Wouldn't be shocked either. The only other person would probably shock me would be Strowman. He would probably be the only one that I'd be like, wow, we're really going really to go there. But The Undertaker, Goldberg, or Brock Lesnar winning wouldn't shock me in any in any capacity. Now, here's here's how I see it. If it's on, if it's on the SmackDown side, then yes, definitely Bray Wyatt. Um, Bray Wyatt is definitely a, a shoe in to win it on the SmackDown side. That's for sure. That that if he, he would definitely be my pick. But like I said, you know, there's a lot there's a lot of pomp and circumstance with the Undertaker being in the Royal Rumble match itself to not consider him a potential candidate to win. That's all I'm saying. Overall, Raw was okay. I kind of think that they're planting the seeds for Mick Foley's departure as GM as he is dealing with with some health issues. And I think that it would be, obviously, uh, a ratings boost for WWE if they ended up getting a new GM due to Mick Foley either obviously being written off or quote-unquote injured and a new GM taking his place. If that were to pan out, I would love to see um, Paul Heyman as GM of Raw. I think Paul Heyman, having Paul Heyman on TV every week is good. I think it'll give him something to do when Brock Lesnar is not fucking wrestling for his, you know, one of his five matches a year. Uh, I wouldn't, I would definitely not mind seeing uh, Paul Heyman being a GM for Raw. If I had to have any other choice outside of Paul Heyman, and I'm being honest, probably and again this is this is you know I wouldn't mind you know Ric Flair I wouldn't mind Ric Flair being GM it would be interesting obviously because him and him and uh, Charlotte are at odds and he can kind of work as a face GM you know in the same vein as 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 Foley but who knows now I see in the chat a lot of people would love to are talking about Samoa Joe in the rumble you never know uh, Val also adds uh, Shinsuke Nakamura that would be pretty fucking cool I wouldn't be sh- shocked if Samoa Joe is in the Rumble. I genuinely wouldn't. I wouldn't be shocked if Shinsuke is in the Rumble. I also wouldn't be shocked if, um, you know, a guy like Bobby Roode or Eric Young got in the Rumble because those are guys that if they come out, they definitely get a, a big pop. That's for sure. I don't know what's going on with Hideo Itami. I don't know if he's injured again, but Hideo Itami is another guy that could be in the Rumble for NXT. That's for sure. Uh, DIY, you could probably do maybe some cruiserweights. Wouldn't mind seeing, uh, you know, Rich Swan in the Rumble or, um, you know, the Brian Kendrick. Wouldn't, wouldn't mind that anyway. It would be kind of cool, but 
like I said, overall, uh, Raw, Raw was okay. It wasn't terrible, but it definitely was not great. Switching gears to the SmackDown side of things, uh, SmackDown, again, was, was a better show. And I got to say, um, the Nikki Bella and Natalia feud is, is interesting. You know, Nikki Bella, just her wrestling leaves a lot to be desired. But I think that the feud itself has some genuine physicality there, which I thought was all right. Um, Kalisto and Dolph Ziggler's heel turn was a, was a cool way to go. I've always said that if you want to get somebody over as a heel, you beat up, you know, back in the day, I used to say, once you beat up Rey Mysterio, you were, you're automatically a heel. So Kalisto is playing the role of Rey Mysterio. Uh, the more aggressive Dolph Ziggler is interesting. Not a hundred percent sure how far they're going to go with it, or if it's going to be a way to get him back into the title picture, but I like it. I like the more physical, the more brutal Dolph Ziggler. I think it's a, it, it's a, it's a refreshing, it's a refreshing change of pace. David says Ty Dillinger has to be in the rumble and he has to be number 10. Yes, I agree. A hundred percent. Ty Dillinger needs to be number 10 in the rumble. Absolutely. fucking lutely I am with you there. Uh, American alpha defeated the Wyatts in a really, really good match, which obviously saw the seeds of dissension being planted. I genuinely thought that we were going to be swerved and Harper and Randy Orton were going to turn on Bray Wyatt and then, you know, go off on their own or even start their own faction. I I really thought we were going to see that, especially after Bray Wyatt ate that kick from Luke Harper. I said to myself, shit, I mean, is this it? Is, is, are they going to turn on Luke Harper? And then the faction is going to be Randy Orton leading um, a new version of the Wyatt family or whatever the case may be with Luke Harper and maybe a returning Eric Rowan. Wouldn't, wouldn't be bad. <laughs> I, I would be, I would definitely be intrigued to see that, but obviously that is not what we got. I, like I said, I thought that the seeds of dissension were there. I kind of, I, uh, every time I see them out there, even though I know Randy Orton's eventually probably going to turn on them, I, I like the dynamic and it actually makes Randy Orton tolerable. I mean, I think the fucking guy's growing out his beard too, to even fit in with the faction. I see his gray beard is becoming more prevalent every week. Um, I, I liked it. I thought the match, I thought the match with American alpha itself was really good. And American alpha definitely show why they belong on the main roster. That's for sure. Uh, Carmella essentially took on uh, a lady who looked like she was pulled out of Boardwalk Empire. I was hoping that the color commentary would be like, here we are, ladies and gentlemen. We have a young lady from New Jersey taking on another young lady from the borough of Staten Island. I was like, that's what I thought. As soon as I saw that lady, I'm like, yo, what is Helena Bonham Carter doing out there wrestling? That was the first thing. And then when I saw that she was essentially wrestling in a one piece bathing suit, I was like, what the fuck is happening? (laughs) That, that, that was all I could say. I, you know, the pairing of, of Carmella and James Ellsworth. I know David hates James Ellsworth with a passion. I'm sure he loves seeing him more on more and more on TV every week. I don't know where they're going with it. I, you know, it's, it's definitely a weird, weird angle. That's for sure. As for John Cena and Baron Corbin's match, um, Really surprised. I thought the match was good. I thought Baron Corbin definitely stepped it up, looking less like Krang. Um, I laugh because his lone wolf shirt reminds me of that meme with the three wolf, sh- the three wolves on the shirt that was prevalent like a year or two ago from Amazon. So it's interesting just seeing the wolf shirt on, uh, and you know him being one of those guys wrestling with a shirt on. So definitely, it's funny to see that. But I think um, Corbin definitely looked good in the match. I think uh, John Cena brought something good out of it. And I also felt that the ending definitely hurt that match. I I can agree. I I knew that there was going to be shenanigans. I was, um, like I said, I did not like, I felt Corbin, you know, John Cena going over clean on Baron Corbin, even though it, it was good, obviously to solidify Cena as, as AJ Styles contender, I felt that it did hurt Corbin a little bit. You know, you're trying to build this guy. You're trying to make this guy, quote unquote, your next, your next guy. And, you know, you're letting him, you're letting Cena pin him clean, which I'm like, damn, you built this guy up as a monster. And all of a sudden he loses clean. I mean, don't get me wrong on the raw side of things. They're doing the same thing with Braun Strowman. But if you notice the matches ending count out, 
disqualification. You end up keeping Braun Strowman very, very strong uh, going into WrestleMania season. And I thought that they were applying that same logic to Baron Corbin. But as it turns out, that's not the case. And for me, I said, damn, so much potential there. And they just fucking squandered it in one pinfall. As for a lot of people were, were, you know, were really very vocal about the feud between Ambrose and the Miz. I think, um, you know, that that feud has some really good legs. I think we're seeing a lot more uh, good mic work and aggression out of the Miz. And it's keeping Ambrose active. And I think the Miz is bringing a little something out of Ambrose. And I think that the rivalry can only get better. And I think it'll benefit both guys in the long run. And um, to go back to, to, you know, the Cena Corbin match, David said, after getting the shit kicked out of him for 20 minutes, it's true. John Cena got his ass whooped that entire match. And then of course we got the super Cena comeback, which like I said, hurt Baron Corbin in the long run. And I'm not even a big Baron Corbin fan, but I understand the long game and I'm like, all right, they're going to build this guy. They're going to do all this shit. And you end up just having the guy lose clean. I'm like, damn, what a fucking wasted opportunity that was hundred percent. That's what I thought it was. All right. Last one before we jump into the other wrestling news, 205 Live. Um, obviously, we pulled the plug on the Cedric Alexander Alicia Fox angle. That's, <laughs> that's my thoughts on that. Uh, Noam Dar is tremendous as the creepy guy. Um, whenever Noam Dar talks, I always compare him to Agent Fitz on agents of shield if you've seen agents of shield you know exactly who i'm talking about especially when he's like alicia fox i'm like that's that's agent fitz from from shield 100 percent. but um noam dar uh interesting he's an interesting asset to the cruiserweight division he's he's a tr- tremendous wrestler um cedric alexander i feel he's losing too much And that bothers me because you did all this work to get Alexander over. The crowd is into him there. He's a, you know, he's got a good fan base and you have him in a feud over a diva that no one gives a fuck about. Yeah. Good work. Writers. Good work. Uh, Brian Kendrick defeating Sean Maluda, a a good match again. You know, Maluda is another guy who definitely showed some tremendous potential during the cruiserweight classic. Uh, Brian Kendrick, as usual, is solid. I thought it was really good. Um, Rich Swan and Tony Nese was, again, just uh, matches that don't disappoint. That's the thing about 205 Live that I've noticed. We're getting consistently solid matches every week. The only thing that hurts it is the venue and the fact that it's taped before Raw or taped before SmackDown or taped after Raw. At the end of the day, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of the day, you're taping this show when the crowd is completely fucking exhausted, you don't have a fresh crowd. You don't have a crowd that knows who all of these guys are. And as a result, you're, you're, you're shooting yourselves in the foot every time. I mean, don't get me wrong. Noam Dar has wrestled on raw. People know who he is. Cedric Alexander, the same thing. Rich Swan, Tony needs Brian Kendrick. We get it. We've seen them on raw. It's a nice way to get them in front of, of the fans and get them interested in these wrestlers for two Oh five live. But if you're trying to create a separate brand for the cruiserweights, then I really feel that the NXT arena and that venue is a better arena to showcase those wrestlers. That's all I'm saying. That's one thing that makes NXT awesome. You know, it's a, an intimate crowd. They're very vocal. They get super excited and they're just as loud in some instances as the crowds in some of the bigger venues, just because they're really into the product. And I think that that's something that 205 Live needs. And it's it's a detriment. And it's unfortunate because the match between Noam Dar and Cedric Alexander was tremendous. And yeah, the crowd was into it. But they weren't into it the same way that a crowd was into these guys performing during the Cruiserweight Classic. And that's unfortunate. But again, it's um, it's one of those things where, you know, the crowd the crowd hurts. The crowd hurts the product. Slick asked, what do you think of this upcoming UK championship? You know, when I heard about it, I said to myself, I understand what WWE's doing. And for those of you that haven't seen it, this is part of the long, the long strategy, which is that WWE is essentially establishing territories internationally. And by doing so, 
it will compete with other, you know, with other established promotions and create a footprint for WWE in those areas. Uh, you know, I feel that going into the UK, there's so much great talent coming out of the UK and Ireland as it is. This is a great platform for a lot of those guys. I mean, Mark Andrews, who wrestled in on Impact Wrestling as Mandrews, is part of that tournament, and he's a pretty solid competitor. So I think that going into the UK, having guys like Nigel McGuinness involved, you know, William Regal is involved, is definitely a step in the right direction as WWE looks to diversify itself. But I have to say this, once you crown your UK champion, I understand that you're going to create weekly programming specifically for the UK, and that's great. But in the, in the, in the interest of getting that, that particular superstar in front of other audiences, will we see the UK champion compete on Raw or SmackDown, or will it be part of a pay-per-view at some point? These are, these are interesting things. I mean, you know, one of the things I'm bothered about with the Royal Rumble is that, and I'll get into it later on, is that the titles, only the two big titles are essentially being defended. And I'll get more into that in a moment. But I think that the UK championship and the two-day tournament that's going on is going to be really good for the network. I think it's great in terms of original programming. And like I said, it's good that WWE is trying to create a footprint in other areas of the world. I would not be shocked if we see a, 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 Japan, a, you know, a Japanese championship only because I think it'd be, it would be a good way for WWE to take the fight to New Japan in their backyard. Um, like I said, I'm curious to see if that's the case, but I wouldn't be shocked if we see, you know, uh, uh, a UK and and perhaps a Japanese championship. I, re I really would not be shocked, but we'll see what happens. Like I said, the tournament is this weekend. I'll be checking it out and um, I'll talk about it more during next week's episode of MTR. All right. So let's talk about the... Um, the rest of the wrestling news of the week, because there were many. And, um, you know, I think that for me, there was probably a lot of, a lot of news that, uh, you know, I left off. But I do want to talk about the Rumble. As I said, you know, the card currently has John Cena and AJ Styles. Roman Reigns taking on Kevin Owens with uh, Chris Jericho in the shark cage. Then you got Bailey and Charlotte. Then Neville and Rich Swan plus the Rumble. You know, it's like Jericho just won the belt, can't defend it. Um, Ambrose and, and The Miz, maybe they're going to defend the, the belt, maybe they're not. I mean, I believe that, the you know, Ambrose and The Miz, they entered. They entered the Rumble, so that, t that belt isn't being defended. And this goes back to what I've said before. Pay-per-views, the big four, all the belts should be defended. Even if the guys that defend the belts are in the Rumble later on, which has happened before, all the belts should be defended. Period. I'll say it again. All the belts should be defended. Period. Simple as that. The Rumble, you, we all know that the Rumble is going to be the main event. Defend all the belts. That's it. Defend them all. Put all the belts up for grabs. Let them be defended in, you know, some short matches, and then just go into the Rumble. That's it. But alas, clearly clearly the other titles don't mean shit. <laughs> but as I said, the Rumble so far, John Cena and AJ Styles, Roman and KO, Bailey and Charlotte, Swan and Neville, and then, of course, the 30-man Rumble match. So far, we got Brock Lesnar in there, Bill Goldberg, Kofi Kingston, Xavier Woods, Big E, which, of course, that means... Um, you know, no, no kind of, of run for the titles, Chris Jericho, which is in the rumble, Braun Strowman, the undertaker, Baron Corbin, Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, the Miz and everybody else. <laughs> um, David asks, who's Jericho going to defend against though? Well, I mean, if you're just doing it at the rumble, I would have Jericho do like an open challenge and I don't know, somebody come out, Sami Zayn come out and challenge even like I said, just to have the belt be defended and then still have Jericho go in the Rumble. That's all I'm saying. You don't got to go crazy. You could just do, you can set up something real quick, or you could even set up something that Monday, the last Monday before the Rumble, we get a quick match, boom, done. Simple as that. Even if Zayn, Zayn is just an example. Zayn goes out there, has a match with Jericho. Kevin Owens interferes. Later on in the night, 
Shark, you know, Chris Jericho gets put in the shark cage and that's it. Then he goes in the rumble, him and Sammy's him and Sammy Zayn fight again. And maybe the following week we got a feud going on with Zayn and Jericho. Would it be the worst thing? No, definitely wouldn't. But alas, it is what it is. On the TNA side of things, a lot of stuff has been going on with TNA. There's a rumor that WWE's um, WWE uh, his the, WWE's former Mexican export uh, Alberto Del Rio may be signing with the uh, newly owned Anthem Run TNA Impact uh, Wrestling brand. We'll see what happens. These are rumors for right now. Um, no, nothing has been signed, but there's a lot of strong discussion that Alberto Del Rio is bound for TNA. We, we shall see if that is the case. As for Impact Wrestling, of course, Anthem announced recently that they have acquired Impact Wrestling. As a result of the ownership change, Dixie Carter is stepping down as the chairperson of Impact Ventures and is now part of the advisory board and has a, main, a, min- a minority equity stake in TNA, which we knew was going to happen. We knew Dixie Carter was going to get the boot as soon as Anthem completed that acquisition. They've already started, uh, you know, really getting involved in the product. They brought back Jeff Jarrett and Dutch Mantle, who many of you know as Zeb Coulter, to assist with some of the creative aspects of the Impact Wrestling brand. There's also a new logo, which looks like a fucking owl. Um, I, I don't know what to say about it. Slick, if you can. Uh, pull up the new Impact Wrestling logo and throw it in the chat for people to see. Uh, you know, I've been watching TNA mostly on Fast Forward. There's a lot of shit that's wrong with the product, but there's a lot of things that that show incredible potential. There's a couple of wrestlers on the roster that definitely have the chops to carry the brand. I mean, Bobby Lashley definitely, you know, being the, one of the bigger stars in the company is is a great asset, and he's become quite good as of late. Uh, you know, you got Eddie Edwards and and just the American Wolves as a unit. The Hardys, of course, Decay, which has really come into its own as a faction. Uh, Jade, uh, formerly, you know, Mia Yim on the Indies, you know, came in as a member of the Dollhouse, has become the new face that, you know, the fans get behind. And, of course, Rosemary from uh, Decay is your knockouts champion. There's a lot, you know, there's a lot of things that are right with TNA, but unfortunately they are overshadowed by all the shit that is wrong with TNA. In any case, um, we'll see what happens. You know, Anthem has officially completed the acquisition. Dixie Carter is pretty much relegated to a a minority role, and I wouldn't be shocked if they just phase her out gradually altogether and leave her as just a shareholder in the company. Like I said, Jeff Jarrett, Dutch Mantle are back. We're not going to see Jeff Jarrett on camera. That's pretty much what's been established thus far. Of course, that can change uh, in future, you know, in future episodes. But for the time being, Jeff Jarrett is strictly working behind the scenes, which I think is good and bad. I mean, the Jarrett, the Jarrett's did a good job with TNA in the beginning. They created some amazing things with the X division and they had some amazing talent. I mean, going back to the original TNA days, you know, we had a Sonny Siaki, Triple X, America's Most Wanted, which was uh, Chris Harris and James Storm. Um, you know, we had some really, really good stuff back then. And just, like I said, amazing X Division competitors. You know, Low Key, Christopher Daniels, Frankie Kazarian, the list goes on, a Who's Who, the Motor City Machine Guns, uh, Beer Money. A lot of good shit came out of TNA. I mean, everybody loves Bobby Roode and how glorious Bobby Roode is, but nobody would know about Bobby Roode if it wasn't for TNA period. And if you go back and look at TNA, Bobby Roode came in as a member of team Canada. Then he went on to having like a rich guy gimmick. Then they put him with um, James storm for beer money. Then they put him with Austin Aries as the dirty heels. All of that was in TNA. So for the people that only recognize the WWE product, you know, Bobby Roode was badass before he came to WWE and NXT watch TNA, especially the old shit. And you'll know what I'm talking about. There's been some new additions to the WWE women's roster. Some of them are female talent that you may recognize. Uh, This was announced on their Facebook page. They announced the signings for Heidi Lovelace, Kimberly, Andrea, and Julia Ho. Um, Kimberly, of course, was trained by Drew Gulak. Um, They, you know, they've done such a good job 
with all of them. Mixed martial artist Julia Ho, of course, uh, definitely is a great asset. Um, Heidi Lovelace is tremendous. She, I think she's going to be pretty, pretty much a badass. That's for sure. Um, both Heidi Lovelace and, um, oh shit. And Kimberly were both in PWI's rankings for the top female wrestlers. So I think that's definitely awesome. Um, you know, a couple of Bubba Ray and Devon's students and um, Julia Ho, of course, who is a singer, model, and also a professional mixed martial artist where she is undefeated. Um, I think that there's definitely some great additions to the women's roster. Like I said, Heidi Lovelace and Kimberly in particular are going to be two competitors to keep an eye on in the future. Now, Switching gears, I want to talk about Ring of Honor, but I also got to talk about Wrestle Kingdom, which was fucking awesome. If you haven't seen New Japan Wrestling's Wrestle Kingdom, there's a couple of things you can do. Uh, Access TV, which gives New Japan Pro Wrestling on Friday nights, is actually going to be showcasing the matches from Wrestle Kingdom over the next few weeks. Of course, this Friday, we're going to see uh, Kazuchika Okada's match with Kenny Omega, which, holy shit, it was, it was a stellar match. Um, you could watch that, like I said, on Access TV, January 20th, uh, they're going to show the IWGP IC championship match with Tatsuya Naito and Hiroshi Tanahashi, uh, the IWGP tag title match with Gorillas of Destiny taking on Chaos and the GBH. Then on the 27th, they have the never open weight six man tag team championship with David Finley, Ricochet, Satoshi Kojima taking on Los Ingobernables de Japón. Uh, the Bullet Club, and of course, Chaos. And you got the Never Open Weight Championship with Shibata taking on Hiroki Goto. That's January 27th. And on February 3rd, you're going to get Cody versus Juice Robinson, which was Cody Rhodes' debut with New Japan Pro Wrestling. You also got the IWGP Junior Tag Team Championship match between the Young Bucks and Rapungi Vice, which was out of this fucking world. For real. You guys got to check it out. Um, and also on February 3rd, the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship match between Kushida and uh, Hiromu Takahashi. Again, great matches. It all starts January 13th, uh, this Friday, with Kazuchika Okada and Kenny Omega's match from Wrestle Kingdom 11. I cannot stress it enough. You guys need to watch this match. Of course, they left off the, uh, the Ring of Honor match between Kyle O'Reilly and Adam Cole, baby. And um, I was I was bummed, but I understand why that's the case. In, in in you know in other Ring of Honor news, a lot of guys' contracts have expired, which of course means that we may see them in NXT or WWE or on 205 Live in the near future. But a lot of guys may also test the waters in possibly TNA and New Japan. Some guys, of course, did get some long-term deals, including Jay Lethal, Bobby Fish, Hangman Page, and Christopher Daniels which all re-signed with Ring of Honor. Jay Lethal, I believe, signed a two-year deal. As of right now, it looks like Kyle O'Reilly and Ray Rowe may be leaving uh, Ring of Honor in the future. Uh, Rowe, who of course competes as part of War Machine, is looking to possibly be part of, uh, you know, go to another organization as a tag team, whether it's New Japan or... Um, maybe re-signing with Ring of Honor or maybe even going to WWE is up in the air right now. Also, Adam Cole, who, of course, uh, was the previous Ring of Honor uh, champion, is possibly heading to WWE when his contract is up in May. So definitely going to be an interesting few months, whether you're a fan of WWE or TNA or even Ring of Honor for that matter. And I got to say, in you know talking about some of these guys, I think Kyle O'Reilly is is a is an amazing wrestler. Not sure if the shooter gimmick would work in the WWE. I mean, it worked with Benoit and some of these guys, but I think possibly in NXT there's a better fit. But who knows? I mean, better things can happen. I'm shocked that you know they didn't try and get O'Reilly and Fish, uh, just because those guys you know those guys would be fucking awesome together as Red Dragon, but unfortunately not. Um, <laughs> Val says, good. I hope WWE jobs Cole to all hell. Why do you hate Adam Cole, Val? I'm curious. Adam Cole is, is tremendous, man. I like Adam Cole. He's such a fucking douchebag. Um, I'm, I'm definitely curious, but again, 
like I said, Ring of Honor is keeping Jay Lethal, Bobby Fish, Hangman Page, uh, Christopher Daniels, and possible departures on deck, Kyle O'Reilly, Ray Rowe, and maybe Hanson from War Machine, as well as possibly Adam Cole. So there you have it. A couple of weeks back, before the break, we were talking about the possibility of a WWE Women's Tournament, which many people were considering was going to happen sooner rather than later. But with the new WWE UK Championship Tournament, it looks like the Women's Tournament has been moved to later this year. Possibly, we may be seeing it in May. But a Women's Tournament is still going to happen. As for the rumors of possible 2017 Hall of Fame inductees, uh, right now, some of the names that have been floating around have been Diamond Dallas Page, uh, the late ravishing Rick Rude, and even The Rock have been um, guys that have been discussed for possible Hall of Fame induction this year. Another name floating around, of course, is Goldberg. So we'll see if any of those superstars are going to be part of the Hall of Fame in the coming weeks. Honestly, if anybody out of that list, I mean, they all have different reasons why they should be in there, but Ravishing Rick Rude should have been in there years ago. I think Rick Rude definitely deserves the honor, and he should be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, You know, DDP has plenty of Hall of Fame uh, things that make him, has plenty of Hall of Fame worthy accolades that make him worthy of being in there. Do I think he should be in there right away? You know, I personally don't think so. I would probably put Goldberg in there before DDP. And the reason is for me personally that Goldberg was a big part of the Monday Night Wars. I mean, DDP was too, but Goldberg really just helped WCW push the envelope even further. And I mean, the NWO, for the most part, have gone into the Hall of Fame. So I would I would honestly say that. You know, Goldberg going in there is definitely a big name. Uh, The Rock going in there. There's there's so many there's so many reasons why you could put The Rock in there. Does he need to be in there this year? Not really. But, you know, given given that, you know, Mania is going to be in in Florida, I can understand the possibility of why they would want to do that. We shall see. While we are on the subject of WrestleMania, of course, WrestleMania 34 will be in New Orleans A lot of people were curious as to why WWE would be going back there so quickly after being there for WrestleMania 30. But it's partially because of a big play that's going on with New Orleans celebrating their, their, I believe it's their centennial celebration. I could be wrong. If I am, obviously, I will uh, correct it in the notes. But in any case, WrestleMania 34 heading back to New Orleans, um, it was a big, big, big financial success uh, for New Orleans. It's a no-brainer to go back there. And of course, Uh, Tying it into the centennial celebration and making the WWE a big part of that was a big part of the reason why it was signed so and announced so quickly. So 34 WrestleMania 34 will be in New Orleans. Like I said, um, this year's WrestleMania, of course, is in Orlando. And I'm sure a lot of states that were left out or that were in considerate under consideration are bummed that New Orleans is getting it again. But, you know, WWE has more than just mania at their disposal in terms of revenue generation, but Mania, of course, is the one that brings the most faces, the most the most attendees, the largest audience to a city versus Rumble, SummerSlam, and Survivor Series. So I can understand why cities are chomping at the bit for it, but considering all the stuff that New Orleans has been through over the last few years, uh, additional help for the economy, especially at this stage of the game, is never a bad thing. So in any case, we are still going to watch it. Last thing I want to mention, NXT San Antonio is taking shape. Obviously, Bobby Roode, Shinsuke Nakamura is your main event. The Authors of Pain will be taking on DIY. And there's also a fatal four-way for the NXT Women's Championship between Peyton Royce, Billy Kay, Nikki Cross, and Asuka, which I think is going to be a surprisingly solid match, even though I'm not a big fan of Billy Kay and Peyton Royce. I understand, you know, what they bring to the table. I just, I'm just not convinced. Um, also a match between Eric Young and Ty Dillinger. I like what they're doing with Sanity. Um, I really think Ty Dillinger should, should get more opportunities. He's incredibly entertaining and a solid, solid performer. Alas, he's probably going to do the, you know, do, do get, you know, put over Eric Young in this match, but we can dream, can't we? In any case, that I think is going to wrap up the wrestling segment for this week. Just a quick reminder, 
Uh, next week, there will no longer be live shows of MTR. We will be going back to a podcast format, releasing episodes Wednesdays for MMA and wrestling and Thursdays for gaming and entertainment. So tonight's episode will be the last MMA, uh, the last live MMA and wrestling edition of MTR. I believe, as I said at the start of the show, the next live show we will probably be doing is MTR 400, which is going to come up sooner rather than later. That's for damn sure. In any case, if you do want to tune in for our final live show on the gaming and entertainment side, join us here tomorrow night. Well, now today, officially, since it's uh, 1 a.m., uh, join us mtrlive.com at 1130 p.m. Eastern, 830 p.m. Pacific for the final live gaming and entertainment edition of MTR. As I said, it is not the end of the show. It is just the end of the live broadcasts. But again, just to reiterate, podcasts will be released Wednesdays and Thursdays. As for us, obviously, we've given you our take on MMA and wrestling. We'd love to hear yours. Hit us up on social media. Check out our links in the show notes for this week. The only thing I will say is if you haven't, join our RageWorks group on Facebook to talk MMA, wrestling, gaming, pop culture, and some of the other stuff we cover on air and on the site. All right, guys, thanks for checking out this week's episode. We will see you all later today for the gaming and entertainment edition of MTR. See you later, guys. I'm rich, bitch. Everything, everything, that's all, folks.